Uh, and again, thank you so much to the organizers for their very kind invitation uh, to allow me to talk about some of the work we've been doing over the past couple months. Um, this has been a fantastic symposium. So uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, for the past 20 years, uh, the main focus of my lab has really been to look at molecular as well as cellular mechanisms that govern neuroinflammation and how this um, influences both host defense as well as disease progression following coronavirus infection of the central nervous system. And what I decided to do is break the talk today into two portions. And um, I'll begin by discussing some work that we recently published a couple months ago that employed um, using neuroadapted strains of mouse coronavirus or MU-CoV. And uh, we interrogated the functional role of microglia, which is really the immune cell of the central nervous system, and how these cells contribute to be with both host defense and disease. And what we found is that microglia indeed are very important in enhancing host defense by regulating MHC class two, which is an important antigen presenting molecule, um, specifically on macrophages. And this then subsequently is involved with um, allowing for efficient CD4 T cell activation. And then in addition, we discovered that microglia um, are important in regulating the severity of demyelination as well as remyelination in animals that are persistently infected with uh, mouse coronaviruses. And then these studies informed our subsequent work that we've been doing in the laboratory. And what this involves is taking SARS-CoV-2 and doing experimental infections of the um, K18 uh, mice that express human ACE2. And um, what we've um, ongoing work has revealed that microglia do augment control of viral replication within the brain. And then um, targeted ablation of microglia, at least to this point, doesn't appear to affect demyelination. So for, again, um, I really don't need to go into this other than the fact that um, mouse coronavirus, which is shown here, is in the same beta coronavirus family as SARS-1, SARS-2, as well as MERS-CoV. Um, again, beta coronaviruses are capable of infecting a wide range of animal hosts, including uh, humans, pigs, cattle, rodents, bats, and camels. And the symptoms that are associated with infection can be either benign or more serious that can include symptoms like pneumonia, uh, diarrhea, and peritonitis. But coronaviruses, a lot of coronaviruses love the central nervous system, uh, like a lot of viruses, like I said. And this infection can result in neurologic disease that can be characterized by both encephalitis and then neurodegeneration. So here, what I'd like to do is just take some time and um, show you some of the work that we've been doing with a neuroadapted strain of mouse hepatitis virus. This is the JHM strain, which stands for John Howard Mueller, who discovered this virus in 1949. And if you do an intracranial inoculation of susceptible mice, and what I mean by that, um, these studies are in C57 black six mice. What happens is these animals will develop an acute encephalomyelitis followed by a demyelinating disease. So if you just focus your attention on panel A here, we do an intracranial inoculation and the viral burden is shown in the red hashed lines. And um, so this peaks at around five to seven days post-infection and then viral titers will start to decline. Very early following um, intracranial inoculation of mice, we see a rapid mobilization of cells of the innate immune response. So uh, neutrophils, natural killer cells, and macrophages are rapidly mobilized and migrate to the brain. Um, the decline of virus ensues following the generation of virus-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells that um, expand in the cervical lymph nodes and then subsequently follow a chemokine gradient into the brains of infected animals. And once these cells get into the central nervous system, they participate in control of viral replication by either interferon gamma secretion or um, lytic activity by the CTLs. Now notice though that um, the virus is cleared, quote unquote, or reduced below the level of detection. And what I mean by that is simply by plaque assay. And so the sensitivity of that assay is about 100 PFU per gram tissue of the brain. The animals really don't clear the virus. Um, importantly, you see neutralizing antibodies that come up later in infection, and indeed, these antibodies are important in preventing viral recrudescence. So to my earlier point, again, if we look at then ensuing demyelination, or that is damage to the white matter tract um, that can happen in animals that are persistently infected with virus, again, here is the viral replication curve. 
it then declines below the level of, uh, level of detection. However, we can detect viral antigen by either immunohistochemistry or viral RNA by in situ hybridization um, for quite some time post-infection. And these are just representative um, uh, examples of in situ hybridization uh, detecting viral RNA. This is in a white matter track of the brain and um, oligodendrocytes, which are the myelin producing cell of the CNS, seem to be a main reservoir for virus in these um, persistently infected animals. And then subsequently then we see ensuing myelin uh, degeneration or uh, demyelination. And this is because infected cells secrete um, very discrete chemokines like CXCL10 and CXCL9 that attract other um, uh, T cells as well as inflammatory macrophages to the site of persistence and then they participate in myelin damage. And so we can detect demyelination in the brain as well as in the spinal cord, sometimes out to a year post-infection. All right, um, just a little bit more about this. These are just representative coronal spinal cords because the majority of demyelination that we see in animals persisted, are persistently infected with these neurotropic murine coronaviruses occurs in the spinal cord. And so this is um, a coronal section of a spinal cord from an uninfected animal stained with toluidine blue. And all I want you to pay attention to is that you see this nice blue staining in the lateral white matter columns. This is the dorsal funiculus where you see a lot of white matter as well as the ventral funiculus. However, in an animal that is persistently infected with JHMV, you can appreciate that in these lateral white matter columns as well as in the ventral funiculus, we often see um, extensive loss of myelin, and this is re the result of demyelination uh, that is occurring in these animals. If you then, um, we do a lot of electron microscopy to look at demyelination and more importantly, remyelination. And what you can see is in an uninfected animal, these are just axons shown here that have these nice thick myelin sheaths surrounding them. In contrast, in the animals that are persistently infected, you see that a lot of this myelin is either completely stripped um, or marginally stripped off these axons. And this results then in paired conduction of electrical and chemical impulses that results in very pronounced clinical symptoms in these animals that are very similar to what you see in people with um, the human demyelinating disease, multiple sclerosis. And then finally, um, we did two photon electron microscopy um, a while back. And all, of, all we discovered, which I thought was very interesting, is um, we see axon axonal damage in these animals that often precedes demyelination. So um, the demyelination in animals that are persistently infected with JHMV, it's immune mediated. Both T cells and macrophages are important in amplifying demyelination. And just very quickly, we don't see what's known as epitope spreading. That is the generation of myelin reactive T cells that might amplify demyelination in these animals. We think that the demyelination that's ensuing is because of a misguided attack against the, um, the, the viral antigen that brings in a lot of activated uh, immune cells that then contribute to the neuropathology. Um, within the past year or so, we've done um, single cell RNA sequencing on CD45 positive cells, um, isolated from the brains and spinal cords of infected mice, because we really wanted to interrogate in more detail the different immune subsets that are infiltrating in at defined times post-infection. And so this TISNI plot is really an amalgamation of um, uh, data that we acquired from um, day zero, so uninfected animals, and then taking the brains at three and seven days post-infection and then spinal gourds at 21 days. And what we learned was, A, we knew these different cell populations were present in the CNS of animals at defined times post-infection just through our, our work and others were using flow cytometric analysis. But the advantage, obviously, of doing single cell is you can get a little more of a granular approach. And, and find these different subsets of immune cells that are occurring or present at defined times post-infection. And um, I just wanna focus your attention here on microglia because we see a variety of different populations of microglia that are present at different stages of infection. And if you go to the next slide, you can kind of really appreciate this ebb and flow of these microglia subsets that are present. And so if on this TISNI plot, it's color coded based on the time of infection. So turquoise here is the control or uninfected animals. Green is three days post-infection, orange is seven days. And then um, again, three and seven days are in the brain. And then pink here is 21 days post-infection in the spinal cord. And if you look at this GG dot plot at the bottom, you can appreciate that these different subpopulations, if you will, of microglia, there's a very clear ebb and flow of these cells 
uh, depending upon the stage of infection, either uninfected animals have this high population of microglia one that we've done, deemed it. And then you see um, this appearance of different microglia that occur at early following infection, and then at seven days post-infection. And then finally, this uh, insulin growth factor one positive population of microglia that are present in the spinal cords of animals that are persistently infected. So these data argued that there might be a very important role for microglia in, in regulating both defense as well as potentially disease. And so again, um, microglia are the immune cell of the brain. And so our question was, do microglia enhance or contribute to host defense in response to infection with the neurotropic coronavirus? What are the functions of these cells in spinal cord demyelination as well as remyelination in animals persistently infected with um, um, our neurotropic coronavirus? And to address this, we employed a very straightforward approach, which was to uh, deplete microglia in um, animals using a drug called Plex 5622. This is a small molecule antagonist for colony stimulating factor one receptor. And uh, numerous studies have employed this molecule to ablate microglia um, in different um, disease context models. And so how we approach this is, um, what's great about this drug is it, it, becomes, it comes formulated in chow. And so um, we can feed um, the, the plex chow or the control chow. This is actually the plex chow, it looks pink. Um, to animals, uh, we do this for seven days prior to then inoculating them with virus. And so a seven day pretreatment with Plex 5622 results in greater than 95% depletion of virus, or excuse me, microglia within CNS. We infect with virus and then we looked at seven days post-infection, taking the brains out, looking at different parameters of host defense, such as viral titers, immune cell infiltration. We also did single cell RNA-seq. And then we looked in the spinal cords to look at the severity of demyelination as well as the immune responses. Notably though, um, the animals were kept on Plexicon fixed uh, the, the Plex drug throughout the duration of the experiment. And so what we uh, determined was consistent with um, some earlier work um, with others that have looked at how microglia aid in host defense following infection with a neurotropic virus. But very quickly, we found that um, um, animals that were fed Plex 5622, there's a dramatic increase in mortality. This corresponded with then um, looking at viral titers in the brain by plaque assay, um, increased amounts of virus at three and seven days post-infection of the brain, as well as 12 days. However, in the surviving mice by 21 days, we could not detect virus, not meaning it wasn't there, but it was just not by plaque assay. In addition, we also saw elevated viral titers in the spinal cord at three and seven days post-infection, but then it gradually, uh, the immune response catches up and control replication. I'm just showing here representative flow cytometric analysis that we performed gating on um, looking at uh, microglia as well as inflammatory macrophages. And the whole point here is that in the brain at seven days post-infection, we see um, an efficient depletion of microglia, which we would have anticipated. However, inflammatory macrophages are not affected. And the same is true in the spinal cord at 14 days post-infection. All right. So um, we then employed the single cell RNA sequencing to see how ablation of the microglia affected the immune landscape. And I was really surprised by this. We didn't see this dramatic reduction. And so this is a TISNY plot looking at um, control mice, which is represented in blue. And then in the plex treated animals at day seven post-infection, these are in orange. And these are the different immune cell subsets that you can see. This is just down here, a TISNY showing bona fide markers for mouse microglia that you can see this robust population of microglia at day seven post-infection. And consistent with our flow data, this is dramatically reduced in the plex treated animals. And then looking at the GG dot plots, this is, gives us an over idea, or overall idea on the frequency of immune cells that are infiltrating in. Of course, we see this depletion in microglia. The only thing that really jumped out is if you just look here, we see this increase in B cells, which I think is very interesting. We're currently exploring how ablation of microglia may affect B cell or antibody secreting cell infiltration into the brains. Um, just very quickly, um, a functional analysis on why these animals might be dying, and, um, and it's related to the impaired ability to control replication. These are the CD4 T cells. We see um, diminished transcripts associated with activation of these uh, uh, CD4 T cells, specifically the transcription factor called TBEX21, which encodes for 
Tibet. And this is a um, transcription factor that's very important or associated with a, a Th1 response. And so for coronavirus infection of animals, a Th1 response is very important in controlling replication. That is via a very robust interferon gamma response and then um, a subsequently a good antibody response. And this impaired T cell or CD4 T cell activation was associated then with um, muted MHC class two expression on macrophages. And so for the non-immunologists in the audience, um, CD4 T cells recognize antigen presented via the context of MHC class two. And the CD4 T cells are important in really controlling subsequent CD8 T cell responses. And I think this is why we're seeing this impaired activation or control of replication of virus in the brain. Now, notably, um, we did see, I mean, the CD8 T cells were there. They did express fairly normal activation markers. Uh, in addition, we saw MHC class one expression in the plex treated man animals uh, in antigen presenting cells, that's macrophages as well as dendritic cell. This was not really significantly infected. And moreover, this effect on MHC class two expression in macrophages was specific because if we looked at dendritic cells, uh, we did not see diminished MHC class two expression on these cells. Now I'm showing you the single cell RNA-seq data, but we also subsequently went in and did flow cytometric, flow cytometric analysis on class one and class two expression on these APCs. And then finally, um, because we're very interested in the um, ensuing demyelination that occurs in these animals, we saw this dramatic increase in the severity of demyelination in the spinal cords of animals treated with Plex 5622. This is quantified here compared to control animals. And then in addition, if you look at this electron micrograph of a spinal cord, um, you can see uh, demyelinated axons here and then normal myelinated axons. And then these axons represented by the blue arrows are undergoing remyelination, that is the, the rewrapping of myelin around them. Notably though, we saw um, a, a deficiency in remyelination in animals treated with Plex 5622. And we can quantitate this by doing what's known as a G ratio calculation, which is a simple, uh, very straightforward measure of the thickness of the axon, or excuse me, the myelin sheath. And it's basically measuring the diameter of the axon divided by the diameter of the axon plus the myelin sheath. So overall, we saw muted remyelination, and that correlated with also an impaired um, myelin, uh, um, myelin thickness. And then finally, the last set for this microglia, the single cell RNA sequencing data also revealed some very fascinating molecules that were associated with uh, demyelination in these animals and that were in defined populations of macrophages. And so a number of these molecules have been associated with disease disease microglia in the context of Alzheimer's disease, as well as other autoimmune models of demyelination. And it's interesting that these are upregulated in our coronavirus model of demyelination. And so we're currently pursuing the functional role of, this, um, of these molecules in disease. But now uh, to transition into the SARS-CoV studies that we've been doing, um, as this audience is no doubt aware, um, Unlike really infection with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, although there's a small literature that suggests that these viruses could get into the CNS, neurologic symptoms are common in COVID-19 uh, uh, patients. Uh, these symptoms, again, range from mild to more severe. Um, this can include loss of sense of taste and smell, dizziness and headaches, strokes, seizures, encephalitis and meningitis, as well as myelin loss. And so the questions, though, that, that come up very quickly are, is this the result of a direct infection of the central nervous system by the virus? And so can the virus replicate in the CNS cells or, and then directly kill these cells and or alter their function? Um, can acute infection by uh, virus result in increased neural inflammation and this subsequently leads to tissue damage? And more importantly, um, can virus persist in the CNS of individuals that results in this chronic neuroinflammatory condition um, and I think this is potentially important considering the long haulers that have been described that have had COVID, they come out on the other end okay, but then they start to developing these long-term effects. And, I, and many of these are neurologic in nature. Heart, um, the, the contrast is, are some of the conditions or neurologic symptoms that are observed, in are these in response to this acute in cytokine storm that ensues following um, infection with um, SARS-CoV-2? 
And so certainly, as we learned earlier today, there's an increased expression of cytokine and chemokines that are elaborated in response to infection of peripheral tissues. And these chemokines and cytokines can get into the CNS and um, alter um, cell function. And then I just point out here, this is a very nice paper by Claudia Lucanetti's group at Mayo Clinic that came out showing that you can see demyelination in some patients uh, that have uh, succumbed to COVID-19. And this is just a Luxol fast blue staining showing loss of myelin um, in a light matter tract in the brain of an individual and then subsequently axonal damage. Um, so we are um, very intrigued by this. And so as I indicated at the beginning of the talk, We've employed um, infection of K18 ACE2 transgenic mice with SARS-CoV-2. There have been a number of studies that have shown that infection of these animals with virus or SARS-CoV-2 results um, in very good lung pathology, as well as infection of other organs, but also infection of the CNS. I bring this paper up only because Stan Perlman um, and Paul McCray made these animals in 2007 when they were initially studying SARS-CoV-1. Stan's I've uh, been a good friend of mine for 20 years, so um, uh, we were able to get some mice from him and we built our colony. And this is a paper that just came out uh, that I thought was very good, showing that infection of these animals results in anosmia as well as other conditions. So, so what did we want to do? We wanted to simply see, you know, um, does, does ablation of microglia in um, SARS-CoV-2 infected animals have any effect on um, uh, viral replication um, within the central nervous system. So using exactly the same model that I showed with the mouse coronavirus, we fed the K18 mice either Plex 5622 or control chow for seven days. We subsequently did an intranasal inoculation with 10 to the fourth PFU. And then we sacked the mice at defined times post-infection, taking brains and spinal cords. We also took lungs, but I'm not showing that data right now. And so this is just to show that in the um, brains of the plex-treated mice, we did see um, a dramatic depletion of microglia. This is just in the control chow animals. This is in the cerebral cortex um, that you can see activation of microglia. And in the um, plex-5622 treated mice, we see this dramatic reduction in microglia. And enumeration of this, we found greater than 90% of the micro uh, microglia were depleted in these animals. And then following the clinical disease, it was interesting. We didn't see what I, well, actually, I didn't know what to expect, but um, we saw no difference in uh, onset of clinical disease. The animals treated with Plex 5622 did get sicker over time, but then they did recover. Um, so that was interesting. And it was in difference or in contrast to what we found with the um, mouse coronavirus. If we did um, RNA scope to look at viral RNA in the brain, again, I'm just showing now the cerebral cortex. What we determined was that there was a dramatic increase in the amount of virus, and this is actually spread throughout the brain. Again, I'm just showing the cerebral cortex here. And if we quantitate this by doing qPCR for spike, um, what we found is there is this dramatic fold increase in viral RNA. This is just one mouse out of the number of mice that we did. It's this representative. Um, an increase in the overall spike viral RNA. And this, we also repeated this for uh, nuclear capsid. Um, and so there's a, a, um, a lot more virus in the brain. And then what was interesting is when we started looking at different regions of the brain and we're following up on this, we're mapping out the cells that are infected. And what's clear is that um, neurons seem to be the primary cellular reservoir for the virus. And this is just, um, this is in the cerebral cortex shown here, and this is a high power magnification. And so these certainly are neurons. In addition, we're also observing some of the um, um, neuropathology that's been reported in people infected with, um, or that have COVID-19, and this includes meningeal inflammation, as well as dramatic perivascular inflammation. And then finally, and I'll stop here, um, we, I didn't show this, but we saw a lot of virus in the brainstem, the medulla and uh, the, the pons area, arguing that the virus might be tracking down into the spinal cord. But if you look at Luxol fast blue staining in, um, this is a thoracic spinal cord um, uh, samples taken from animals on control child or Plex 5622, we really don't see a lot of um, neuropathology as measured by demyelination in these animals. Now, we're going to interrogate this in more detail by doing electron microscopy, et cetera. But right now, it's kind of interesting. We don't see much neuroinflammation. 
Uh, maybe a little bit of cuffing right here uh, in this animal, but nothing really in the plex animal. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up. Um, taking into context the mouse coronavirus infection of the central nervous system, microglia are important in aiding in host defense as well as restricting demyelination, yet enhancing remyelination. Um, the mechanisms for defense include aiding in activation of antigen presenting cells, specifically macrophages that subsequent, subsequently enhance uh, CD4 T cell activation. And we would argue that microglia tailor the microenvironment within the CNS to aid in T cell recognition of viral antigens and control, controlling spread. And then obviously they also have a role in chronic neuropathology. Our data on SARS-CoV-2 infection of the CNS of K18 mice, we saw widespread distribution of virus in the brain. This is consistent with uh, some studies by Mike Diamond and Stan Perlman. Uh, in our hands, neurons appear to be the primary target, although we're subsequently immunophenotyping other cell types through the course of uh, infection. Ablation of microglia enhances or increases viral load in the brain, suggesting a potential protective role for microglia in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection of the CNS. And at this time, I would, I would argue that spinal cord demyelination is really not evident um, um, in these animals, but I think we need to get um, do increase our end value to get a, uh, a firm answer on that. So I would just simply like to acknowledge um, the wonderful students in my laboratory that have done this work. It takes a lot of, uh, as you all know, it takes a lot of training to work in the BSL-3. And so I, I go in and do all the infections and then assist with the necropsies. But these people are fantastic. Rob Edwards is a great colleague in the Department of Pathology that's aided in these studies. And then uh, again, Stan Perlman at Iowa, Sean Whelan at WashU have been very um, important to us, as well as colleagues at Scripps and UCLA. And with that, um, thank you very much for your time and for hanging out for the last talk of this uh, symposia. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Tom, that was great. Thank you so much. So we've got um, questions. We've got two people asking, maybe many people asking the same issue, which is, you know, how do we relate the mouse to the human? Um, you know, how, how much can we uh, assume similarity and, and what differences are there really between the mouse and the human in terms of demyelination and everything else? And I guess a related question to me that I might have missed is, are these mouse, this K18, is it a, is it a transgenic um, ACE2? Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a transgenic ACE2. It's the K18 promoter for epithelial cells. And so um, I'll dovetail off that or use that as a springboard to address the other questions. And um, which is, I, I'm not sure because um, if you, <laughs> I'll be honest, because we have a lot of lungs and brain samples from COVID patients that died and we can detect a lot of virus in the lungs. Very rarely at all do we see viral RNA or protein in the CNS. And if we do, it's primarily vascular. Um, and that's consistent with a nice paper that Tony Weiss Corey came out with. I will say that um, one thing that we're very intrigued about is comorbidity. So if you have Alzheimer's, for example, um, does that increase the penetrance of the virus in the central nervous system, particularly if, you know, if you're much older? And then furthermore, um, the one brain sample that we have is from an individual that was, had true HIV or AIDS and then died of COVID. There we can detect um, a lot more viral RNA in the brain, all right? So, but I'm not sure that the viral, that the, the K18 model accurately represents what's going on in the CNS. Nonetheless, though, we can inf it gets, at least get some information about some immune mediated mechanisms of control, right? So that's where we are with this. I completely acknowledge that. I think we might need to look at building better models. Yeah, I mean, probably the ACE2 distribution is not normal in those mice, and whatever normal means anyway, it's probably right. not, not the human. Well, no, and it, I don't think it's expressed very at high levels in the brain anyway. And if you look at a 2007 paper by Stan Perlman, who made these mice, um, SARS-1 just lit up the uh, neurons in the brains, right? And so, you know, why is that? Um, I think that's a very important question that needs to be addressed. Yeah, so, in, and maybe, in, as you say, in humans, maybe there's not that much virus and so you know the cns stuff in humans might be different i don't know yeah I, it's it's but i think nonetheless it's a very important area of study again getting back to these long haulers right and it's not 
it's not uncommon, right? Because you, there's some beautiful studies on, um, you know, influenza survivors, right? That have these long-term neurologic consequences. So, you know, it's a journey of a thousand steps and we're one or two steps into it. And there are a lot of very important questions to ask. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to do.